Welcome back to another video. This one's going to be about building a modified synchronous buck boost converter. Now a buck boost converter, I think everyone knows what that is. Synchronous just means that we substitute the diode with another MOSFET to lower power losses because usually the resistance of a MOSFET that's turned on is going to burn a lot less power than the forward voltage of a diode. But why did I say that it's going to be a modified buck boost? Well, traditionally we have the ground connection, which is in common with the input and output. And the other output terminal is negative with respect to ground. But this has the inconvenience that the source of the first MOSFET will be going from a positive voltage when it's turned on to a negative voltage when it's turned off. And then if we add a second MOSFET to make it a synchronous converter, we have to drive this one with a always negative voltage because the source is always negative. So what if we switch things around just like this? Well, we can see that the source of the first MOSFET is connected to ground. And this is very convenient because we just need a normal MOSFET driver. And then for the second one, if we want to make it synchronous, this has the source that will be going from zero to the input positive supply. So this isn't beautiful, but it's the same thing as if we had a half bridge converter, which is uh, pretty common and therefore there's a lot of MOSFET drivers that are made to do this. Now what changes because of this modification? Well the only other thing that's different is that the output will have its negative terminal that is in common with the input's positive terminal and the output positive terminal will be even more positive than that. And essentially we can say that the output is stacked on top of the input as far as voltage goes. To illustrate what I mean you can kind of look at it this way. Now hopefully that makes more sense. So for any application where you don't care about the relation between input and output voltage, this circuit should be more than fine. So here it is working on a breadboard. And there's a few particular things about this. The fact that I'm using an 80 tiny microcontroller to generate the PWM, an AND gate to generate the dead time, and then I'm using the classic half bridge driver that I usually do, just because it's what I have laying around. But let's first look at the inductor real quick. And I got the core off of an old power supply that you can see here. I chose this one because it's just the size that I was looking for. And it used to be a transformer, probably for a flyback because it has a gap in the middle. And obviously I'm going to rewind it to make a normal inductor. I tried my best to sand down the gap just because I would like to have the highest possible inductance factor. So the first thing I do is I have to figure out what the inductance factor is so I know how many windings I need. So after sanding down the gap, I wound it with uh, seven turns and then I measure the inductance like that. And it came out to about, I think, 30 microhenries. And this means that the inductance factor is about uh, 0.6 microhenries per turn squared. And uh, now we have to figure out what we want our inductance to actually be we can use this formula. And so this comes out to 400 microhenries. And the reason why this is so high is because I'll have to switch at a very low frequency of about uh, 30 kilohertz. And this is because the microcontroller only has a clock of eight megahertz and using a timer with an eight bit period, it comes down to about that frequency. So now knowing the inductance factor, we can calculate the number of turns that we need to get to the inductance that we want that comes out to be about 26 turns. Now unfortunately I wasn't able to get uh, so many and I think I only got like 24, 23. So uh, that comes out to an inductance of about 300 microhenries which is still acceptable. And uh, this also means that we'll have a little bit more DC current that can flow before we saturate. And speaking of saturation we have to figure out at what DC current that actually happens. So just knowing that we want to stay below 0.3 Teslas just to be safe, that comes out to about 2.6 amps, which isn't beautiful, but I guess I'll accept that because it's not like I have much choice. And I'm not planning to draw too much current from this thing anyway, especially because my power supply can only deliver like 1.8 amps. So I won't have any problems there. Next, let's take a look at the PWM generation. Since I didn't have an IC that could generate the appropriate PWM signal, I decided to use the 80 tiny 10 just because it has fewer pins and fewer things and so it seems more efficient as a choice. It has a total of 6 pins, 2 go away for supply and 1 is the reset, which uh, you could technically repurpose but I'm not going to do because it kind of becomes hard if you want to reprogram it then. 
and so we have three pins left. Two of them will produce the PWM signal, PB0 and PB1, while PB2 will be the input to the ADC to receive uh, feedback of the output voltage and correct the duty cycle. The ADtiny10 only has one 16-bit timer, so I'll be using that to generate the PWM. I won't go into any of the details because you can check out the data sheet yourself, but I'll quickly show you the code because it's really simple and at least you can recreate it or uh, learn something from it. Okay, so looking at the first part of the code that sets everything up, we have to start by selecting the clock prescaler to have it as high frequency as possible. I'll use the internal oscillator that goes at 8 megahertz, so this will be the frequency both for the core and for the timer. Next, we just set our two pins that will be generating PWM as output pins. And then we have to essentially set the polarity of both pins. So one has to be high during the first part of the count of the timer and the other one has to be low and then they have to switch. So this is how we do it. And then we have to choose the wave generation mode. And I'm gonna choose the fast PWM mode with an eight bit period. And this means that our output frequency will be a little over 30 kilohertz as we saw previously. And unfortunately there isn't any way to make this go faster unless we uh, reduce the period. And if we do this, we lose resolution on our duty cycle, which isn't great. So I'm just gonna stick to this and it will work fine. Next, we just choose uh, the prescaling for the clock and we don't want any prescaling because we want it to go as fast as possible. And then we uh, have a variable PWM, which will just uh, remember what the duty cycle is. And output compare register zero A and B are the two registers that have to be written to choose the duty cycle. And it's important that they're always the same value otherwise we could have overlapping of the two signals lastly we just have to enable the ADC which will read an analog value from the output voltage of the converter and uh, provide feedback Next, we have some code that loops infinitely. And the first thing we do is start the conversion, which is just a measurement from the ADC. We wait a little bit. In this case, five milliseconds is way more than it needs to convert the value, but I don't want it running at a super high frequency anyway, because it's not necessary. And we read the ADC value. So the way this control works is that we want the feedback to ideally be always two and a half volts. And so since the ADC is an eight bit one, it means that we want it value to always be 128 which is a half of 256 so if it's higher than 128 we just decrease the PWM by one if it's lower we increase it and this should ideally always keep it around that uh, target value that we want this is obviously a very rudimentary way of doing the control but it's not the purpose of this video to have a digital control. I already talked about that topic in a previous video and I think I made a PID so if you want you can check that video out and then the last step is to just update our PWM value for the two registers to determine the duty cycle of the output pins. Now because the two registers OCR0A and OCR0B are double buffered, which means that their value gets actually updated when the timer resets, I want to avoid that this happens right between the update of the two registers. And so for one counting cycle of the timer, the two registers are different and uh, there's overlap between the PWM, which might actually cause a short circuit. So this is the reason why I put the while loop that waits for the timer to be at a relatively low value and not too close to the reset value. All right, let's finally take a look at the circuit. Here you can see it's on a breadboard, and I know this is looking pretty messy, but I'll make a PCB later anyway, so it doesn't really matter. After connecting power and giving it about 12 volts, you can see that the gate of the low side MOSFET is switching, so that's definitely doing something. Here you can see that turning the potentiometer changes the duty cycle, so that's definitely a good sign as well. Now let's take a look at the two signals coming out of our microcontroller. Here you can see them on the two channels. The one underneath is the low side MOSFET and the one above is the high side one. And if I zoom in here you can see that there's really no dead time. And if you know something about power supplies, you know that we need dead time with this kind of a circuit. So how am I managing this? These two signals go into this mystery IC, and when they come out, you can see that there's definitely a dead time. And so let's take a look at how this is done. So here's a drawing of our two signals without any dead time. If we could delay the rising edge of every signal, but not delay the falling edge, this would give us effectively a good, reliable dead time. But how do we do this? 
without using a ton of components. Well, one way would be to have a RC filter in parallel with a diode, which essentially lets the capacitor discharge a lot faster than it can charge. Although I was having some problems with this because of the diode capacitance and stuff, and I didn't have any good diodes around, so I decided to ditch this idea. And instead I tried to see if I could use a single IC with a logic gate. If we keep our RC low pass filter, we can see that every edge is going to be kind of delayed. But how do we make it so that one of the two edges is not delayed, the falling edge? So let's take a look at just one of these signals. And then we can separate the sharp signal with the one that passes through the low pass RC filter. And we can see there's exactly four distinct cases. So let's map out what we want our output signal to be for each one of the four cases. Now if we call the sharp edge signal A and we call the low pass filtered signal B and we can call our output Y, we can insert all the values in a little table and this should probably ring a bell for you if you've seen any digital logic. And this is exactly the truth table of an AND gate. So this means that we can just use an AND gate for each one of the two signals coming out of our microcontroller and the result is a constant and reliable dead time. Now you might have noticed that I still haven't talked about how we produce our feedback voltage uh, to control the PWM. And this is a little bit tricky actually if you think about it because we don't have a common ground. Therefore we're going to have to come up with something a little bit different. So what I decided to do is use a normal optocoupler and these are pretty common in most uh, isolated power supplies. And so this is the circuit that I came up with. I didn't come up with this circuit using any rigorous math or anything. I just kind of did some trial and error. And so with the help of this potentiometer, we can kind of change how much current flows uh, through our LED inside the optocoupler uh, as a function of the output voltage. And so we can effectively change what our output voltage stays at. Okay, so finally we get to the full schematic. And here you can see it in its entirety. Looking at the PCB here, you can see that it's a simple two-layer one. All the components will be on the top, and there's nothing too special about it. But we can look at the 3D model and get a better feel for how it will be afterwards. A useful tip before ordering your PCB is always write uh, some of the connections that might not be obvious when you're actually using the PCB. For example, the input and output connections, which each one is, and for the TPI port for programming the microcontroller, the connector can go on both ways because it's symmetrical. And so it's handy to have written down on the PCB itself which connection is what signal so that you don't risk reversing the connector. Another useful thing could be to add the title of what it is and perhaps we can add the input voltage so that later on if we forget we know how not to burn it so easily. After exporting all the Gerber files, I'll zip them together and check him one last time with PCBWay's Gerber file viewer, which I'll link in the description. And here everything looks like it's fine, so we can proceed with the order. I'll be ordering with PCBWay.com, which is also the kind sponsor of this video. And here you can see that I'm getting an instant quote, uh, just inserting some of the parameters of my PCB. While I'm doing this, let me tell you that PCBWay has a bunch of services that it provides, including 3D printing, CNC machining, flexible PCBs, PCB assembly, and much more. So just about any project of yours will be covered by PCBWay services. So definitely check them out for any project that you're thinking of making. Now that we're done inserting the parameters, we can see the quote here and it's just $5 for the five PCBs, so super affordable. Now that this is done, we can add this order to the cart, upload our Gerber files, and an engineer will take a look at them and uh, check that everything's fine for us. After just a few minutes, everything's approved, so this means that I can go ahead and order the PCB. And after just five days, I got the package at my home. Here you can see the PCBs, they're looking just great, I would say. Another note is that PCBWay is offering the purple solder mask at no extra charge for the whole month of September. So if that interests you, definitely check out PCBWay.com and order a purple PCB before they start costing more. They're also having some great discounts on FDM 3D printing, so definitely check those out too. The next step is just to solder everything together, and unfortunately here for some reason my camera can focus, so sorry about that. One small note is that these two resistors have to be soldered on after programming the micro controller because otherwise it doesn't work. Finally everything's done and it's time to test this thing out. As you can see here I have a setup measuring input and output voltages and currents. 
and a variable load here at the top. So let's see what kind of efficiencies we can get from this thing. The input will always be around 10 point something volts because I'm using a lead acid battery that's uh, towards the end of its life. And the output voltage can go anywhere between 5 volts to even 20 potentially. Although I did have a limit on the duty cycle on my firmware that I uploaded. So it's kind of limited to 17 at low loads and then the voltage falls a little bit when we increase the load. So whatever, that's not a huge deal. After testing it at different output voltages, it's uh, time to graph the efficiency. And uh, well, this graph's kind of looking weird. Well, actually, I think it's kind of fine. The power output actually isn't too high because unfortunately the current meter on the output is a little bit limited to half an amp. So yeah, the power output is definitely a little bit low. In any case, we can see that the efficiency is uh, definitely reaching 85% and a little over that, which, yeah, honestly, I was hoping for 90 perhaps, but uh, I think the fact that we're using the AND gates and the microcontroller and all that stuff probably lowers it a little bit. Also, the fact that we're passing small amounts of power through it doesn't really help because it means that a higher proportion of power is going into the auxiliary circuit rather than being transformed. So here's a few final notes about this project before ending the video. For one, I had to add some bypass capacitors closer to the MOSFETs to lower the uh, spikes on them because they're definitely having some ringing. And also, I know that people will probably be saying in the comments, you shouldn't be using a microcontroller. The, there's ICs for this stuff. You're coming up with stuff that doesn't matter. Well, the project wasn't to make the best possible converter. It was to essentially have fun and uh, come up with something a little bit new. Additionally, the MOSFETs that I used are definitely not the right ones for this project because they have a very high drain of source uh, voltage and uh, relatively high resistance. If we use appropriate ones, we'd probably have single digit milliohms instead of I think like 100 and something for these, which is definitely not contributing to the efficiency now that I think about it. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. If you feel like subscribing and liking, I'd appreciate it and hope to see you in the next one.